Hi everybody, we'll get started now, I think. Welcome back, it's our last week <laughs> um, of kind of discussing, um, where's my book go? <laughs> Here it is, Inspired. Um, we do have some more copies in the office if you did not get one and still want one. Or if you want to get it to share with your uh, beloved friends and neighbors, <laughs> or if you want to start your own book group, I mean, it might be a nice um, way of uh, sharing the the word as well. Um, and I want to give a, a vote of, of encouragement because so far I haven't finished it, but it's really very interesting. Good, good. Really, really worth reading. Yeah. And um, Sue Swing and I, uh, we're having a really interesting conversation this week, uh, and I don't mean interesting in the passive-aggressive Minnesota sense that I'm used to, <laughs> um, but an actually interesting conversation um, about what gives Rachel Held Evans, as a writer, as an author, um, authority. Um, one of the reasons I like this book is because it's written by a layperson. Now, Rachel Held Evans is a layperson who's in conversation with lots of Bible scholars and with lots of pastors. But I think the fact that she's not a, an ordained pastor actually gives this book more power uh, than if it were just another pastor with a PhD writing about it. <laughs> um, in many ways, I, I'm, I'm convicted um, sometimes of our clergy privilege when it comes to leading and, and being the voice that that shapes the discussion. And so soon I'm talking that if you go online and read some of the critical feedback of the book, it's often that who is this non-pastor person to tell us? <laughs> and that's the very thing I find really captivating about it. Um, and that it can be a voice from um, beyond the, beyond the, the uh, what's it called? <laughs> the altar table. What's that? Chancel. There we go. <laughs> The White Tower. Beyond, right, you know, and to crack a little bit that ivory tower that is, that goes back to the Renaissance and and the Reformation. It feels like a very Reformation-y movement to say uh, this is it. So I just want, I thought I'd share that with you because I think it's an interesting part of uh, why I like this book is that um, she she I think she knows what she's talking about, but she's not, you know, God forbid that pastors don't have. I know a word and authority on everything. Oh my gosh. Uh, let me just take out my plastic tab now. No. <laughs> so uh, that out of the way, um, today I want to focus on both uh, the gospel stories chapters, um, which are around the gospels, uh, but also what is the gospel? What is the good news? And um, if we have time, I'd like to get to the fish stories, which is the miracle chapter. Um, We've talked about the miracles in some other places in the Bible today, so I want to focus first on the Gospels. Um, and I love um, what she said, and that is, every Christian gets a testimony. And again, that opening up, every Christian gets a Gospel according to blank. So I want to know, and I'll give you a minute to think about it, so you don't have to be on the spot, because this might be hard. Um, if you were to give me, or if you were to you know, write on a piece of paper, this is the gospel according to Carol. What would your, what would your one sentence of here's the good news from my shovel, <laughs> based on your own faith and your own understanding of the Bible? What would, what would be your one sentence? Here is the good news according to me. So take a minute, ponder that, um, and uh, if you feel comfortable sharing. That would be great. So we'll give folks um, some Jeopardy Think Music <laughs> in my head and not out loud, because that'd be bad. Um, and it's copyrighted, so YouTube might get mad at us. Um, <laughs> but take a second and think, what is the gospel according to me? What is the, if you were to condense it out into a nutshell, what would it be? Ready? Begin. Boom, boom. Uh, 
when I was a uh, middle school baseball umpire, I would use the Lord's Prayer as how long I'd give the manager or coach to talk to the pitcher on the pitcher's mound. At the end of the Lord's Prayer, I'd go, okay, break it up out there. It's a little bit like the Jeopardy thing. So, what is the gospel according to you? D, you were ready from the start. Yeah, God loves you no matter what. God loves you no matter what. Yeah. Great. Others want to share? Trudy? God is in charge. God is in charge. And on the converse, that means <laughs> I'm not? Question mark. I mean, <laughs> God is in charge. God is in God control. Others. What is the gospel according to Chris? God's grace and mercy is for all. God's grace and mercy is for all. That fits with the story we heard today, right? Yeah. Others want to share their their gospel postage stamp? It's okay. I just, think, I just think of one phrase, and it goes with all of what we heard today um, about God's grace. It goes with uh, the hiring of the uh, vineyard workers at the last hour, people, human beings think that there's fair and unfair, but it always rings true. God said, thy ways are not my ways. Yeah. That's similar to, I'll give you mine. <laughs> um, God reckons us good my own interpretation of Romans 4, um, where God reckons Abraham and his faith is righteous. Um, what Michelle Obama keeps saying in her autobiography. Am oh, good enough? yeah. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I feel like that, that more than, I think that is a, a particular message of gospel, specifically to our era, to our time frame. That but I think one of the, the primary burdens people bring to church on Sunday is, am I enough? And it might be as a parent, uh, the amount of, and, and social media magnifies this, right? The amount of pressure that we feel, and it might be of other generations too, but I think in our, our present era and circumstance, um, not feeling like enough is a perpetual, perpetual place of, of personal shame and and self-hatred, sometimes even self-flagellation. Luther talks about sometimes he'd rather like keep flagellating himself like bad Luther, bad <laughs> Luther, because that's easier sometimes than asking God or, or trusting in God's forgiveness, you know. And so um, there's all sorts of ways we do that here and now as well. That's why it's so comforting to think God's in charge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And if you work for a really awful boss. <laughs> I can imagine God being in charge might not feel like super comfort, you know. I think, and part of what I think Rachel Evans is getting at is that, that what is gospel for each individual and for each community is vastly different. And this is, um, Luther talks about this in terms of the law and the gospel. So um, let me think here. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Is that, is that something that you hear as good news? Or is that something you hear as, oh, i got to do that? <laughs> which, which way do you hear that? Love your neighbor as yourself. It depends on the neighbor. It depends on the neighbor, right? So all gospel is contextual. Where do I fit on the continuum? Yeah, right? Yeah. And so um, that's one of the challenges about preaching about evangelism, about teaching. Um, oftentimes, people find out I'm a pastor and they like hide into a hole. <laughs> they don't actually hide into a hole, but you know, you see this happen sometimes. And and one of the things I'm always flabbergasted by is that the number one thing people do is apologize for their language. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I just swore 30 seconds before I knew you were a pastor. Um, I'm like, it's not a big deal. I'm a potty mouth, but. Um, <laughs> But what's interesting is that, that we have all of these notions that, that my job is to proclaim Jesus' love for the world, right? God's grace and mercy are for all. Um, but yet, the first thing I <laughs> instill in people sometimes, by my simple presence being known, is fear. 
field. And for other people, I walk into a hospital room and they see I have my collar on because I just came from church and it's the most comforting thing in the world. You know, and so even something as simple as what I wear, um, or just knowing that I'm a pastor, if I'm carrying my little communion kit into freighter, some people are like, I don't think it's far away from me. <laughs> you know? And this happens with the Bible and with the gospel too. Um, and so one of the challenges is, you know, the word gospel. Anyone know the roots of it? The Greek word for gospel is euangelion. Eu, E-U, or E-V, in evangelical, meaning uh, good or well. And angelion, you hear it like angel, evangel, that word means message in Greek. So an angel is literally a message or message giver. And so it's the good message. Um, and that comes us through English through the word God spell, which is um, where the musical of the same name gets its name. <laughs> and um, the notion there is God, a word of God that is spelled, almost like hocus pocus spell. And so in English, gospel, um, you know, if someone walked up to you and said, I have the gospel truth. And I purposely did that accent. Sorry, Southern friends who are watching the video. Um, you know, they, what, what do you think of that word? Does that, what does that word gospel mean to you? If anything, it might mean absolutely nothing to you. And that's perfectly okay. When you think of the word gospel, what do you think of? Well, in the context you just said, the way you said it, it means like the absolute truth. Like you're not. Right. Mm -hmm. You know. No room for thinking or debate right. or, this yeah. Is yeah. 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 What are other, other ways you hear gospel used? Good news. Good news? Yeah. Truth. Truth. So maybe gospel it's truth is, gospel. yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I, I say most people that I talk to, talk, I say, here's the gospel. They go, well, which one is that? Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John? So they're referring to the, the literary genre that is the first four books of the New Testament, which is also right. <laughs> um, that those gospel writers call their books messages of good news, uh, gospels. Any other things stick out to what that might be, feel like for you? Uh, this is a shameless promotion, and it's... Uh, I think a really helpful book, but also it's pretty terse. Um, but there's a really great book from about five, ten years ago almost. Um, Douglas John Hall is a Canadian uh, theologian. Um, we've talked about him in some other adult ed forums before. Um, he is prolific in writing. He's uh, retired now. Um, and he comes through the, the Canadian Protestant tradition. So he's not Lutheran, but Lutherans love him. <laughs> Um, in part because he does a lot of work on the theology of the cross. Um, and so he has some great books about God and suffering and, and the future of the church and other pieces. Um, and he sees his role as being an, a theologian for North America because he's Canadian. He's like, we get left out up in Canada most of the time. Um, and uh, a few years ago, he wrote a book um, called Waiting for Gospel, in which he talks about how um, the church, it, it's his critique of how Christianity has lost its gospelness. It has, it has invested in other messages and in other programs and in other strategies, and sometimes the church has invested in just keeping itself going, which is totally honest, right? Um, but then he said, what people are coming and what people who aren't coming on Sunday mornings or Saturday nights are looking for is they are hungry for gospel. They are hungry for some word that gives them comfort or that gives them freedom or that gives them assurance that they're enough or <laughs> you know, they're good enough, but that um, that's contrary to the ways the world talks about stuff. And so this whole book, uh, it's a really, again, it, it's a deep read, but I found myself highlighting all, <laughs> all of the electronic pages um, of just a really powerful kind of um, reflection on how, uh, in his mind, the church has lost 
the gospel um, in trying to be other things or uh, to be all things to all people. Um, this is a side. This is just an aside. But when I first got my church paperwork for my first call in Rio, they thought they were funny, and they had like 300 words to describe the context of the church. And they're like, "We are a small uh, congregation in rural Wisconsin. We're looking for a pastor to walk on water and be all things to all people." <laughs> and I was like, "Huh." <laughs> Are they serious? And they thought they were being funny. I didn't find it particularly funny. Because uh, I said, well, you know that um, even Jesus couldn't do that, and they crucified him when he tried. You know? but, um, but there is a sense in which you know, sometimes we're hungry for whatever it is that we think, and the gospel might not always line up with that, too. Uh, it's a place where sin can sometimes creep its uh, head into things. See, I heard... You say people are looking for gospel. It's very contemporary because... I just read a, an article last night of how communication allows us to know everything negative going going on in the whole world. Yeah. And this author countered it with, wait a minute, people live in an adjunct poverty. There's only half as many people as there were X number of years ago. And he yeah. told them all the improvements that you never read in the news. So I'm saying maybe my gospel would be the world ain't as bad as a lot of the various types of media would want us to think. Yeah, I remember four years ago, right after I came to St. Matthews, um, I read an article in Sojourners magazine that talked about how the world is at its least violent point in human history. Mm -hmm. Nuclear proliferation has actually prevented, I mean, there's still threats and things, but like, if you, if you, if you total up all of the deaths at the hands of violence, 2015 was like, the best humankind has ever done. <laughs> Syria can uh, Syria bit. shakes out a little bit, but again, that I was like, no, yeah, that can't yeah, be right, you know. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and again, it's and it's all in how you count and what statistics mm -hmm. and how we figure out history and stuff like that. But, but I think that that part of the reason we're hungry for gospel, I hear you saying this, Herb, is we're constantly inundated with here's all the things that aren't working, mm -hmm. here's all the things that are broken, mm -hmm. and we need to know those things sometimes. You know, so that we might try to transform them, or you know, awareness can help lead to um, self-awareness, which can help lead to transformation. You know, those things. But boy, yeah, you know, the, the negativity of the world. We're hungry for gospel, Trudy. Uh, this is many years ago, but I've never forgotten that maybe some of you here might be old enough to remember when there was a green sheet and there was a column in it written by Peg Brack, and and she was mostly a homemaker who uh, uh, highlighted funny things that were happening in life. Anyhow, she's talking about uh, a family argument that results with a husband and wife really coming to loggerheads. And she said, but let us remember that while these two are fighting, there are millions of other people who are resolving their problems and feeding the kids and putting them in bed and <laughs> loving each other and making their way through all these arguments about whether the carpet needs replacing or whatever. And I thought that is a really nice balance. We hear about the, the violence and the tragedies and the really uh, absolutely terrible amount of violence and never think about the thousands of other people who are slogging along doing the best they can, not killing each other. Yeah. And so too within the church. Mm -hmm. Because if there's one thing that is destined to, to predict the downfall of Christianity in church in uh, America, is how many fights are over what color carpet to get. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I speak that with all seriousness. Yeah. That we've lost Jesus sometimes in the midst of this. Um, so I want to play a little bit of the excerpts. This is from page 150, if you have the book alone. Uh, where Rachel Hildevin set forth, sets forth her kind of idea of what gospel looks like and how it is so highly contextual. So we'll listen for a couple of pages. Get comfy. The good news is as epic as it gets, with universal theological implications, and yet the Bible tells it from the perspective of fishermen and farmers, pregnant ladies and squirmy kids. 
This story about the nature of God and God's relationship to humanity smells like mud and manger hay and tastes like salt and wine. It is concerned not simply with questions of eternity, but with paying taxes and filling bellies and addressing a woman's chronic menstrual complications. It is the biggest story and the smallest story all at once. The great quest for the one ring and the quiet friendship of Frodo and Sam. Much has been made in recent years about the value of rendering the gospel into a single digestible aphorism. D.L. Moody claimed he could fit the gospel on a coin. I was once challenged to sum it up in a tweet. But it strikes me as fruitless to try and turn the gospel into a statement when God so clearly gave us a story, or more precisely, a person. Indeed, in scripture, no two people encounter Jesus in exactly the same way. Not once does anyone pray the sinner's prayer or ask Jesus into their heart. The good news is good for the whole world, certainly, but what makes it good varies from person to person and community to community. Liberation from sin looks different for the rich young ruler than it does for the woman caught in adultery. The good news that Jesus is the Messiah has a different impact on John the Baptist, a Jewish prophet, than it does the Ethiopian eunuch, a Gentile, an outsider. Salvation means one thing for Mary Magdalene, first to witness the resurrection, and another to the thief who died next to Jesus on the cross. The gospel is like a mosaic of stories, each one part of a larger story, yet beautiful and truthful on its own. There's no formula, no blueprint. Flannery O'Connor once said, quote, a story is a way to say something that can't be said any other way, and it takes every word in the story to say what the meaning is. You tell a story because a statement would be inadequate. When anybody asks what a story is about, the only proper thing is to tell them to read the story." Unquote. So when someone asks, what is the gospel, the best response is, let me tell you a story. You might start with Abraham, Isaiah, or Luke. You might start with the Samaritan woman at the well. You might start with a story about your grandmother, or a rural church camp or a dining room table surrounded by Woody's chairs. At some point you will get to Jesus, and Jesus will change everything. There's a story in Matthew's and Mark's Gospels about a woman who anoints Jesus with a jar of costly perfume in prophetic anticipation of his impending arrest and crucifixion. When the disciples harass her for what they see as a waste of resources, Jesus defends the woman, declaring, Truly I tell you, wherever the Gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. His response suggests that preaching the gospel means telling stories about the life of Jesus, not simply his death and resurrection. In the words of Pope Benedict XVI, quote, Jesus himself, the entirety of his acting, teaching, living, raising, and remaining with us is the gospel, unquote. This is what the New Testament is about. It's the good news of Jesus told from multiple perspectives. The Gospel According to. The books of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, often referred to as the Synoptic Gospels, tell the story through spiritual biography, drawing from eyewitness accounts, existing source material, and the author's own memories to recall what Jesus did and taught. The book of John tells the story with a bit more creativity, adding new accounts and changing or embellishing details to make larger theological points about the significance of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. The Acts of the Apostles describes the impact the Good News had on thousands of people living in communities around the Mediterranean, and in particular on Paul, a devout Jew, who initially sought to suppress the Christian movement, but then had a dramatic conversion experience and became a critical advocate for the inclusion of Gentiles in God's redemption story. The Epistles, or letters, which comprise 21 of the 27 books in the New Testament, give us a glimpse into how various first century churches understood, debated, and applied the implications of the good news to their daily communal lives. All told, the New Testament provides 27 first century documents testifying to what Jesus said and did, and to the impact he made on the doctors and fishermen, peasants and religious leaders, men and women, Jews, Samaritans, Africans, Greeks, and Romans who encountered him. God did not see fit to print the gospel on a coin, so why should we? I really like this book. <laughs> I hope you like listening to little segments of it um, as well. 
Oh, what stuck out to you as you listened? What, what resonated or what made you go, hmm? I think she she's stating the, the importance of it as a whole and not to try to compartmentalize certain portions of it. Yeah. You need to understand each gospel as a whole. And the fact that she says it's told from a different perspective, it, it people say, well, this contradicts that. No, I, I like the way she says it's told, each one is told from a different perspective. Yeah, we're not getting in the business, you know, I'm a Bible geek. I love comparing the Gospels to see what says what, who says what, because I think there's something to learn. <coughs> but, what, but what that loses is the sense in which we have four different, but no less true, in that kind of capital T truth sense, factually we don't really care, <laughs> but no less true accounts of Scripture. Um, about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Um, and that's, the fact that we have four, and that they've perpetually maintained those four, and they haven't gotten harmonized, to me, is something that's worth worth naming. Not as a point of, well, John disagrees with so-and-so here, but to say, this is John's take. And one of the things that's been really helpful in biblical studies over the past 70 to 80 years is the more that archaeologists and and those who study these books have learned, the more we've been able to put each gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in its own contextual community. So that we can presume Matthew wrote to this group of people. That's why he uses these Jewish references. Or Luke is writing for these people. John, he's just kind of crazy. No. <laughs> um, does anyone here have a favorite gospel of the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Yeah, Beth, but why? Like you like John. Any reasons why? Um, just because it's a little bit more mystical. Than mystical. Yeah. yeah, that's a great word. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, that's great. Carol, you have a favorite? Luke. Luke. Why is Luke your favorite? You're going to ask me. I'm there off to be my Moshe. <laughs> <laughs> Luke has the most women in it. That's a, that's a reason to like it. <laughs> Luke, no, is, Luke is this pastor's favorite gospel, too, by the way. Uh, <laughs> Anyone else here have a favorite? It's okay if you don't. You take whatever we give you on Sunday morning, right? <laughs> it's like, which Flintstone vitamin do you really want out of the container? Um, the purple car was my personal favorite. Anyway, um, do you, anyone have a least favorite gospel? I do, because I'm weird. <laughs> my least favorite is Matthew. Because um, I think Jesus is judgier in Matthew, and I struggle with that as a Lutheran. <laughs> um, there's a lot more damnation. <laughs> um, it feels like to me in Matthew. Jesus is just too black and white for me in Matthew. Um, the other gospel writers paint him a little more. He's black and white in some places, but I'm not, I'm not in others. So that's my own, my own wrestling with that. Um, but I, what struck my, what struck me, especially as I was thinking about it in, in our conversation today was the sense of, I love what she says about, we lose track sometimes of the fact that the Gospels are stories. And so when someone asks you, well, what do you believe? Do we ever just say, well, why don't you read the Gospel of John? And maybe you'll understand it, maybe you won't. But this is, you know, I've never once done that in my life. Well, it's, I find that interesting because I've had people say that to me too, that, you know, they'll, whatever the situation may be, they have gotten inspiration in that situation from this text. And yeah. I go read it, and I think, I don't know what you got from it, because I'm not getting the same thing, because yeah. everybody comes at the story differently. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's um, I'm going to go on a little, little tangent, I want to come back to story. So don't let me forget story. <laughs> story. Um, so I've been working with uh, uh, a seminary student, Joanna, who led um, some of the prayers and worship today. And Joanna um, comes from a, a church unity on the south side in Bayview. Um, and she split her time as a, like a seminary learner, learning about the context of ministry, both at St. Matthew's and at Reformation. 
Now, there are two very different Lutheran church communities, the context of which is not just like we wear albs here and they don't there, you know, but it's like the whole message of what do you preach um, would be totally different. You know, that, that what do people hear? What do people bring? What are the burdens people carry? You know, in each place they're very different. Um, so that, that's just one example I've been reminded of, like, <laughs> there are no universals, um, it feels like, when it comes to some of those some of those contextual pieces. But I don't want us to lose the fact that there is a universal truth to the gospel story. Um, and that is uh, the story of Holy Week, of Good Friday and of Easter. Um, the empty tomb and the cross are, I think, what connect all the stories together. So for me, there is no gospel if there is no Easter. And so that that's, that's a piece, that's to me where, what holds it together. Easter is not contextual <laughs> in the way that some of these other stories or parables or, or, you know, she talks about the rich young man versus the Ethiopian eunuch. You know, those people hear Jesus' message differently. But Jesus dies and is raised for both of them. So to me, that's the, that's the one non-negotiable in all this, because I feel like the great challenge is, well, if it's all just contextual, why even read it together? <laughs> you know, uh, Trudy's context and Fred's context and Don's context and mine are all so different. We're never going to agree, so why even get together? You know, and we all become. My fear is that we all become our own individual. Our own individual gospels don't come together around a certain issue, and so for me, that's why I think the church is important <coughs> to have Easter. Uh, Rita, um, how does that relate to the Christmas? Or the birth of Jesus. Yeah. Is also universal? Um, I think so. And, and what happens on Easter for uh, Christians is powerful because of what happens on Christmas. So so I would say, so I'm going to be theological for a moment. You guys can go there. I trust you. <laughs> so Christmas is, is what we call the incarnation, God becoming flesh. And it's because of that, God becoming flesh, that... Um, Jesus, when he's crucified, allows God to know the deep pains even of human suffering and torture, sin and death. Uh, and there's a great number of uh, Christians who would say God, God's own self, dies with Jesus on the cross. And then God raises Jesus from the dead. So incarnation and resurrection... <laughs> need each other <laughs> to happen. Mm -hmm. um, so resurrection, uh, let me see. Easter is dependent on Christmas happening. But Christmas does not need Easter to be powerful. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So for me, that Easter is the turning point because okay. Easter <coughs> Easter's the end of the story. Yeah. Or the beginning of the story. <laughs> right. Um, and, and that depends on incarnation happening at Christmas. But the Christmas could stand alone and could stand on its own and we wouldn't have to, you know. So uh, that's my own take. Mm -hmm. You can disagree or think otherwise. <laughs> yeah. Beth, you have um, Yeah, well, I've been uh, thinking a lot about, um, as I read through the New Testament, what message the apostles would have been speaking to the people. Yeah. And um, it, it's kind of different throughout the entire Gospels and Book of Acts. You know, sometimes they talk about the resurrection or... You know, so what, what Jesus is saying, the story that Jesus told, and she talks about that as being a story, but then I'm trying to, to look at the message that's being spoken, and it's not always clear, and it's not always the same. Um, so it's just another way that I have of looking at what they're really trying to say. Yeah, yeah. A and that, what are they trying to get at? That's. Yeah. Um, what's, it, what's important to them, you know, yep. when they're speaking the message. Yeah, and that, that they have to bring themselves and their own experiences to the story. You know, like, as a preacher, I bring my own life experience. <laughs> um, as a parishioner, you bring your own life experience with you to church every Sunday. Um, which is actually a really great segue back to the story, so thanks for that, Beth. <laughs> I, um, I would encourage you, if, if you have the book, um, there's a section that, right after what we listened to. Uh, where uh, Rachel Levitz talks about um, the kingdom of God 
or the kingdom of heaven. Um, and I think that, that that might be one one way of describing what is unifying about all these different messages. Um, and Jesus says, repent, go and proclaim the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Now, what is that? Well, that's a whole other class we don't have time for today. But I encourage you to think about what that, you know, um, what that looks like. My favorite translation of kingdom of God um, is from Dan Erlander, he's a Lutheran pastor. He wrote the Manna and Mercy book that Pastor Margaret used and I've used and others have used with you too. Um, he talks about God's, he talks about the kingdom of God is God's work to mend the broken universe so that God's original dream for creation and humankind could finally be fulfilled. So there's a, pro- there's a part of reconciliation. It's also like God's dreams, if we can only imagine, will be fulfilled. Uh, but that's still pretty abstract and vague. <laughs> um, but I think you know that each apostle, right? Paul, Peter, James, John, Carol, Nancy, <laughs> Joanne, you know, we all have, I just called you apostles, did you notice that? Um, <laughs> Carol, I love you. Um, but that we all are called to share this good news. Um, and, and it might be that we say our little postage stamp, right? Jesus loves you. But I want us to think for a minute, um, and I'll play some more Jeopardy music in my head. Um, what is a story in your life where you experienced good news or where you experienced God's love and it might be a really you know it might be in your childhood like uh, like she said in the excerpt we heard it might be a story about you and your grandparents it might be about you and your grandchild (laughs) but to think about where is a story where I felt the love of God or the presence of Jesus in a way that I knew and felt it in my bones. Or, if you're not a pietist, (laughs) um, where's a place where I feel like I finally got it, even if for a moment? What's a story in your life of some place where you felt forgiveness or reconciliation that was not your own doing? So I'll give us 30 seconds, I'll tell a brief one of my own, and then I'll invite you to share if you have any stories of gospel that you feel are particularly um, appropriate. So, Jeff, what do you think of music? Get in your head. <laughs> Was it easy to think of a story? No, yes, a little bit of both, but rather than no. I'd encourage you, if it was hard, to take some more time. It's hard to come up with it in 30 seconds, especially if you're not a, um, not a good, like, if you, if you don't, like, I put you on the spot, you didn't know this was coming, right? So now, maybe it's a great, a great if it didn't come easily today, if you're not, there's no, nothing wrong with you. <laughs> there's no deficiency. Um, but I would encourage you to pray or use that in your own devotional or reflective or spiritual time this week. Think about what are stories where I felt um, some sort of unconditional love or gospel or, or something like that. Um, and maybe one will come a little bit later. Um, 
the first one might not be the best one. So even if you had it 30 seconds or less, <laughs> uh, I'm an ADD person, so I, I get a prompt like that. I'm like, yep, got it. Uh, so the story I wanted to share is just a brief one. Um, I was in seminary and had fallen out of uh, friendship with a good friend of mine from college. Um, and it had been complicated and it had been lots of different things. And, and it was a little bit of unrequited mutual feelings of, are we friends or are we more than friends? Um, we, we weren't clear about that, and, and I felt a lot of conflict in this kind of, I was like, okay, fine. Um, so I was feeling kind of, I don't know what the word is, um, just kind of cut off um, from what had been a really life-giving relationship. And um, it was right before I went back to seminary, and my pastor wanted to get the last of his vacation in, <laughs> and so asked me to preach in my home congregation um, for Labor Day weekend. And... Uh, this friend lived probably two and a half, three hours away, and somehow found out that I was preaching, and she and her family, like, came to my church on this Saturday night, and they'd actually been visiting friends for a wedding that week. It was just a weird coincidence. They said, oh, let's, you know, they heard I was preaching, and they said, oh, let's go listen. And boy, it was really messed with my head that then it came time for a communion. <laughs> and the person with whom I had this conflict and had felt really cut off came to my line for a communion. I said, well, shoot. <laughs> God, <laughs> this is kind of um, scandalous grace here, but I guess I've got to figure out my own stuff here if I'm going to be okay <laughs> sharing the sacrament. And so this, you know, what became a, a really um, surprise visit ended up becoming a really transformative understanding for me of what what the, met, the meal of forgiveness and what it means to serve that um, can look like. And I think about that on the regular. So that, that's one story that came to my mind. Um, and I'm a, like, as a preacher, I like have to think about these stories a lot and how I talk about them. So um, anyone else feel comfortable sharing their own gospel story? Yeah, Herb. Yeah, in eighth grade, we had a deaconess, which was at Bob uh, Olive here in town. I was in grade school. And she brought the light. We always were, I always was feeling like, wow, you're a deep guru for all of what you've done, and what, what's life going to be? And after a while, and she taught religion to a class, and I kind of feel like, hey, what? you're okay. It'll be okay. And that was just a sense of that, just by the way she did and said things in the light. And a little sidelight to that. At one point, she was trying to talk me into going to Concordia High School, which was prepped for being pastor, and I told her, no way in the world. Because <laughs> I, at the time, I my God, I could not come up with an original sermon every Sunday. And that <laughs> scared me out the door. So, but we didn't get like people like you too, Herb. Yeah. <laughs> if you had trouble finding a story, sometimes those, those transitional points in life, adolescence, adulthood. Sometimes, oftentimes, those are places where those moments are, are often clear. So thanks for sharing. And let's give thanks to God, too, for the witness of that deaconess who was able to, to be present to you. Yeah. This is it's one of the strangest things that has ever happened, not to me, but uh, I, I lost my friend Francis last year. Yeah. But in 19, in 19 they were, he and his the only girl he ever dated were married at the age of 20 in 1961. She was a foster parent and she would take in children, treat them like her own, she had two children of her own, clothe them, feed them, and then when they were <coughs> able to be sent on their way, everything they had would go with them. In 1975, she contracted cancer and Francis was so upset he was starting to lose his faith. He says, how can this happen to somebody who was such a good person? And he would go and see her in the hospital and she went into a deep coma. So he was sitting there and he was just saying, how, if there's a God, how can he let this happen? And from the coma, she said, I'll be home on Sunday. And he thought this was just some random thing. So a week goes by, and the doctor calls him on Saturday evening, and he said, I can't understand how this could happen. 
He says, your wife is cancer free. And he says, we can't figure out how this happened. He said, can you come Sunday and pick her up and take her home? And he couldn't believe it. He went and he took her home and they were eating dinner on Sunday night with the kids. And he said, you said in, your, in a coma you'd be home on Sunday. She told her she was in heaven and that God told her he was losing his faith and she had to tell him that he was real and that he should have lost his faith. And then three weeks later, she got the cancer, came back, and she passed away. And he never forgot that. And he always said to me, he said, why would that happen? He said, I still, he says, I still can't understand that. And I said, someday you will have an answer. The older boy went to prison for a crime that he didn't commit. The younger boy became an alcoholic, but he got through that. The older son came home. I said to him, I said, just, if she would have lived to see that, that would have broken her heart. I said, God took her so you wouldn't have to see that. And he said, he said, you told me I'd have an answer. I said, you gave me one. So that was how it was. And then we would always have lunch. And then I said to Dee, I said, I can't understand why he doesn't come to lunch. And she said, well, he died. She showed me the thing in the paper. So they're together. Mm -hmm. Sometimes those stories can be yeah, it, it, it's just stories of others. They just amazing. Practice. It was a miracle. People say miracles don't happen, but they do. Mm -hmm. She had to tell them, don't lose your faith in God. He's there. We've got time. One more person wants to share theirs, Chris. <coughs> um, I also think my most difficult was when I was um, getting divorced. But God's love and his mercy um, was there like every step of the way. I mean, it took me years to even be able to say the word divorce. Mm -hmm. um, but he would put people in my path that would <coughs> put my face and I knew that I would get to a place where I actually could forgive, which was always a really, and still is, a difficult thing for me, but that was one of the things that it has shown me the most. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, you know, no matter what, if I keep the faith, you just can keep on your path, and it just, it helps you every single day. so interesting and powerful to me. There's no words to kind of conclude that I've heard. So thanks for sharing your story. It strikes me about how <coughs> each person's story involves another messenger, right? The gospel requires messengers. <laughs> um, and that doesn't mean you have to go out and stand on the corner of <laughs> Otterwood and, and Wauwatosa here and, and, and be that messenger. I don't find the guy with the car with all the bumper stickers and the, the loudspeakers to be particularly convincing, personally. <laughs> but your stories um, are powerful in their honesty and in their vulnerability and their rawness. Um, and in the fact that they're, they're honest about the gospel is not just he is risen, <laughs> right? It also begins in those times of trial, in those times of... Um, suffering that's inexplicable in those times of life transition that's just challenging when you don't believe in yourself you know and so like that's i think what douglas john hall is talking about when he says we're hungry for gospel we're hungry for reminders of the places and i think the stories of scripture can be super helpful especially um the stories of jesus but also there can be gospel in the old testament <laughs> There can be gospel in the Old Testament. Third time it means it's true. There can be gospel in the Old Testament. <laughs> um, and whether that's the story of David, divinely chosen, royally flawed, or the story of some of the, the, um, the faith 
the faithful and strong women like Deborah, or whether it's in the stories of prophets who are like, no God, but become messengers anyway. <laughs> and they're never ordained, by the way, the prophets. <laughs> Did you notice that? <laughs> but that all of them also are, are messengers of, of transformative news, of, of love, of, of hope that brings us sometimes to the verge of tears and sometimes to the verge of joy. And so, um, if nothing else, this chapter has been super helpful for me and encouraging me to think about with you all, but also like, what does good news feel like? Because I don't think it always feels like Easter brass. <laughs> um, closing word, I just uh, sent Sonia off this week. The next voice comes out on Palm Sunday week. Um, and there's a beautiful reflection I happen to come upon on, um, from a, a man named Craig Barnes. Um, he's a Presbyterian. And he wrote this beautiful reflection that I had her reprint. It'll be in the voice. The gist of it is this. Um, one, that uh, if you come to Easter on Sunday morning and expect to hear the gospel, you will hear it. <laughs> And you will hear the brass, and you will smell the flowers, and um, it will be a joyous occasion. Uh, but what the author challenges this, Craig Barnes challenges us to do is say, what if you just don't trust the brass automatically? <laughs> what if you bring your vulnerability and your honesty and your doubts to Easter, just like Mary, who doesn't know she's going to meet Jesus in the garden? Um, how might Easter surprise even you? And the line he ends with is, maybe, just maybe, we'll experience Easter and not just go through it. And I feel the same way about gospel. That exploring your own stories of where God has touched you, where God has put those people in your path, might help you to experience good news and not just hear it. To, to have the lived experience of it. And to replay those memories. Because um, my guess is, I'm going to pick on you, Herb, because you're in the front row. But that the messages that that deacon has shared with you are probably still relevant how many years later. Definitely. And that's the power of grace to me that's so cool. These stories have been here for 2,000 years and more. And something about them is still compelling because it changes us. Oh, that was far more powerful than I ever could have imagined, y'all. So thanks for sharing and for digging and for wrestling. and. For reading or not reading or listening <laughs> uh, and uh, god's peace to you and may the gospel uh resonate in whatever key you need it to uh, at this time in your lives and in your moments peace, everyone.